so uh, I'm Ken Watton. I'm uh, the lead fund manager of the, the company we're going to talk today about, which is Strategic Equity Capital PLC, which is a London-listed investment trust. I'm also the, uh, the, the managing director for public equity investing at Gresham House, uh, which is a, also itself a listed company, Gresham House PLC, uh, listed on AIM. Um, a specialist fund management company. Um, and, and the fund I'm going to talk to you today, uh, SEC, I'll just give you a, a few quick snapshots and then we'll talk you through kind of how we do things and some of the, the investments that we have, uh, which is probably the, the kind of more, most interesting part for you. Um, so we are uh, a highly concentrated uh, fund focusing on UK smaller companies, smaller listed companies. We typically will have between 15 and 25 individual investments. Uh, at the moment, it's 18. Um, and the majority of the value um, within the fund will be in the top 10 companies. So about, currently, it's about 80% of the value is in 10 companies. So we're taking pretty concentrated uh, positions in a small number of, of companies where we've got very high conviction. And then importantly, uh, we are trying to add value to those companies as investors. So we're trying to take meaningful stakes, uh, be, be uh, material influential investors in those companies and try to add value and help them to create value for shareholders. The result of that is you have a genuine small cap portfolio, it's high conviction um, and it has a low correlation in terms of its returns and the output of what we're doing versus the stock market and versus some of our competitors. Talk to you briefly about Gresham House. We should, sort of, given this is a, a, a shares event, we should sort of give a, a little plug to our own uh, uh, home as well. So Gresham House PLC, it's a, uh, an AIM-listed, um, London AIM-listed company. Uh, GHE is the ticker. It's a, it's, uh, we describe ourselves as a specialist alternative investment manager. So we uh, manage about eight billion uh, sterling of assets, of, of which um, my, my team is part. Uh, and, and those assets are across a, a number of different specialist strategies in real assets. So we have funds in forestry, sustainable infrastructure, new energy, and also real estate. Um, and and uh, my, my, my previous speaker talked about battery storage on, on a residential level. We, we have uh, a, a fund called GRID, uh, the Gresham House Energy Storage Fund, which is the largest grid-scale battery storage uh, infrastructure owner in, in the UK and in internationalising. And we have... Uh, strategies in, in equities, both public equity, which I manage, and then also private equity, which is, a, uh, uh, which is adjacent and is a really important part of our, our process. And I'll talk about that a bit more in, in, in a few slides' time. So that's Gresham House. Um, our equities business is very well invested, so supporting this strategy is a big team of people. We've got um, 26 investment professionals across the business, across both public and private. We've got a very experienced investment committee, including people like Bruce Carnegie Brown, who's the chairman of Lloyds of London, as an example. Uh, we have specialist functional expertise in technology and in people. Um, and, and then we tap into the group's expertise uh, in sustainable investment, which is increasingly really, really important to our underlying investors. So we have a, a very well-invested platform. What do we do with it? Well, and, and why is it important? Why is it different? Uh, so we are smaller company specialists. So if you, if you were to invest in uh, strategic equity capital, which I'll call SEC for now, from now on just to make it a bit easier to, 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 to say. Um, so if you invest in SEC, you are investing in a fund which is the, the best ideas of uh, a smaller company specialist platform. We have a disciplined process. It's a process we've developed over the last 16, 17 years. I'm in my 17th year of doing this now. Um, modelled on the best bits of private equity applied to public companies. And then we have a powerful network, again, built up over the last 16, 17 years, of experts that are proprietary to us that we can access to help us to make better investment decisions. So it's not just about the team we showed in the previous slide. It's also about the wider network that sits behind it. Why is smaller companies interesting? Well, in the UK is a bit out of favour and a bit unloved by international investors, by professional investors. The asset allocation uh, sort of consensus again is, is to be underweight in the UK. So you know, that's, that's all very depressing and it's in, in, the, in the press quite a lot, um, how the UK stock market is uh, sort of moribund and uh, being overlooked now. But to me, that, that's a fantastic opportunity. The UK market has got loads of great companies. You'll hear, hear some of them today. Um, and it's trading at really attractive 
valuation multiples. So that, that to me is an opportunity. It's not, it's not something to be uh, unhappy about. Um, and, and the smaller down the market cap spectrum that you go, and you can see on the left-hand chart here, the, the better value that, that we can find. So the smaller the companies, the less well-known they are. You know, sometimes you get fantastic opportunities like companies trading at, a, at the, the, the market cap is the equivalent to their cash and you get the business for free. I mean, you know, that, that, that to me is quite a compelling opportunity. Um, so the, the smaller down the market cap spectrum you go, the, the, the better value you get. If you get the right company and those companies can grow, then you not only get uh, value created by the companies growing their profits, but you also get potentially get those companies re-rated in a positive way as well. So small cap and UK, we think, is an exciting area to be fishing in. We talked about taking a, a, the best bits of private equity. Uh, our process uh, is really somewhere in between a typical public equity fund, which is very diversified, where it's quite passive in terms of the manager's uh, interactions with the companies because they've got so many, um, and private equity where you know, it, it's very illiquid. You've got a private fund, you've got people sitting on boards of companies. We're trying to do something in the middle. We've got some fantastic businesses that are listed in, in the small cap part of the UK market. Uh, so we think we, we can take a concentrated approach, a bit like private equity. We can be quite involved in those companies, a bit like private equity, but you have a bit better liquidity because they are listed and there's potential for you to sell the shares in the market as well as uh, potentially the, the whole company is being bought and sold, which is typically how private equity would, would exit. I talked about our network. So you know, we, we have a private equity business within Gresham House. I spent 12 years working in a UK mid-market private equity house called Living Bridge. That's where this strategy was, was, uh, of, of taking a private equity approach to public markets was developed. Um, and we've built up a really powerful network over the last several years uh, as a result of that. Uh, a network of people from all sorts of different uh, areas of special, specialism. And the thing that we think is really, really important is when we find a good company uh, and we have a really strong uh, investment hypothesis about that company, the important thing is not to just think that we know best because we're uh, you know, fund managers sitting in London and, and everyone comes to us. We, we think it's really, really important to test our ideas, to test our hypotheses on these companies with experts who've, who are operators in particular areas, who are advisors or specialists in particular sectors, so they know more than we do. And, and by testing our judgments, really honing them, we can really build our conviction. And that's what the result of this portfolio, uh, the result of which is this portfolio. And then finally, before I start talking about stocks, this is, this is the last bit on process, is um, you know, we talk about taking an active engagement uh, approach to, to investing in small cap companies. So I, don't, I want to make the distinction between activists, so who, which ha, has connotations of being really aggressive and horrible and firing people. We're not doing that. We are, we are, but we are actively engaged in a collaborative way with the company management teams and the boards of the businesses we invest in. And that's because we think we can bring that, that network I showed you on the previous slide. It's not just about us testing our ideas. It's also about introducing people to the companies who can help them. That might be specialist advisors who can help them to navigate entering a new market. It might be an M&A advisor who can help them if they're looking to divest of a, of a subsidiary or to sell the whole company or to make acquisitions. Or, or it might be uh, individuals who have relevant skills and expertise that can be added to the board uh, and join as non-executive directors. So all these things are part of, of, of our armory as an investor and really quite different to how most public company fund managers will operate. I'll give you a case study. So this is a particular company. Um, you know, it's, 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 a recent, uh, well, it's a recent takeover situation of, of a company. This was our, our largest investment within the trust. But it gives you a, a, hope, a hope of sense when I talk it through of, of how we think about investment, the kind of things we're looking for, and then the kind of things we do after we've invested. So Medica uh, is a, a healthcare services business. Uh, it, it does outsourced tele-radiology services. So it's got, it's got a bank of qualified radiologists who are interpreting medical images, uh, both for the NHS as an outsourced partner, but also into the pharmaceutical industry as well. I mean, some of you may have come across the company. Um, it has a lot of the characteristics we like. It's in a structurally growing market. There's a, a structural undersupply of radiologists uh, globally, but, and particularly in the UK. Um, and there's an increasing demand for their services. So a, a, an outsourced provider like Medica that has the technology platform and the contracts uh, is really very in demand for, to try and met this, 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 this need, which is increasingly becoming more difficult to, 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 to meet. Um, it's a company that has uh, international presence. It's growing double digit at the top line. 
It's, it's, it's got strong margins, over 20% operating margins, so you know, indicating of a quality company. Uh, it's capital light, so it's generating a, a lot of cash. It turns a lot of its profits into cash. Um, and, and it's demonstrated that over a number of years. It has a high-quality management team, high-quality board, uh, which we've built a strong relationship with. And we identified when we were building our stake in this company that uh, you know, we were paying a, a valuation multiple for the business, which was you know, at least 50%, if not more, uh, lower than similar businesses in private markets were being bought and sold for. So we, we have a very good relationship with uh, mergers and acquisitions specialists or advisory <coughs> firms, we, we have a good network into private equity of buying and selling companies. Uh, and, we, and we make it a real strong point of when we're looking at an, a listed investment, not just benchmarking the valuation against the company's own history or against uh, its listed peers, but also trying to understand what, what are private equity, what are corporate buyers paying uh, in private markets? What are they, what, how do they value the whole company rather than just the, 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 the marginal share that's traded on the stock market? Uh, and that gives you a really good sense to build conviction that, yes, I've, if, if this is a good quality company and this similar business has, has been bought in private markets for a, a very significant premium, then, then I'm probably paying a decent price. And I think it links in with what I was saying before about the UK being out of favour and smaller companies being even more out of favour. That's creating some fantastic bargains. That's, created, that's, that's really throwing out some opportunities of high quality companies which have been derated because of big picture stuff about the UK and not really to do with things about their own fundamentals and, and how they're growing and what they're doing and the demand environment for their products in their markets. So Medica is just a brilliant example of, of this. And we, we knew that a private equity firm had paid about 14, 15 times EV EBITDA for a direct competitor of Medica about 18 months ago. And we were buying the shares of Medica at around eight, eight and a half times. So we, so we knew there was a big margin of safety in the valuation multiple that we were paying. We then, uh, once we built a big stake in the company, this is kind of to our active engagement, we worked with the board and we, we, we encouraged the board to evaluate whether or not there'd be interest in, buy, in, in, in a third party buying the business because it was, the stock market was not giving them the credit for what they were doing. And we didn't necessarily want them to sell the business, but we wanted them to, to really sort of get, engage an advisor and, and evaluate the possibility. And then uh, once they'd done that, to put that side by side with their in existing independent strategy. And you know, if they decided to stay independent, explain to us how they were going to realize that value as an independent company. So they went through that process. In the meantime, another competitor was being bought by private equity, again for 14, 15 times EV, but whilst this company still traded on the market at a big, big discount. Uh, so they listened to us. Um, they engaged Evercore, uh, an investment bank, to, uh, to evaluate the, the possibility of a sale of the company. And then that's what happened. So they, they received a takeover approach from private equity firm IK Partners, a uh, Swedish, Scan uh, Scandinavian, uh, London-based uh, mid-market private equity house. And they got sold on a, uh, a multiple of 16 and a half times uh, their trading profits and, and 14 and a bit times their, their prospective profits. So very similar to these other companies and, and a big uplift, 50% premium to the sixth month rolling share price. And you know, we, we'd, we'd like to think that we had a sort of fairly material impact on, on creating that opportunity for, that, for, for shareholders to realize value at, at a price we felt was, was a, a benchmark price uh, you know, which the, 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 the private equity and corporate market had tested. So it's been a great uh, case study for us, a big contribution to returns, and, and we will get the cash back from Medica in about a week and a half's time. So, um, and the good, thing, good news is we've got lots of interesting opportunities to reinvest the cash into. So um, the, 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 I won't dwell on this, but this, this is a... a you know, the takeovers that we've had in the portfolio over the last sort of two, two or three or two and a half years since I've been the lead manager of the trust, um, you know, the average takeout multiple is 13 and a half times. Um, and, and, and just remember that when, when I show you what the average multiple of the current portfolio is. Um, you know, the average premium, 46%. Um, so this, this is a real, you know, there's a lot of takeover activity in the moment because the market's sort of derated de small cap companies. Uh, we think there's a big opportunity to create value either by companies that we own having approaches or by them being re-rated when people start to notice this difference. 
I said to talk about stocks, we talked about Medica as a case study. This is a snapshot of our top 10 uh, in, in the portfolio uh, as at the end of March. We sort of published a quarter, quarterly uh, uh, presentation and, and, and update to shareholders, so the next one's due fairly imminently. Um, you can see that Medica, I think I've got, here we go. So here's Medica. So at the end of March, it was 14% of the portfolio. So you know, we took a very uh, decisive, concentrated position in, 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 in this in this stock and, it, and it's paid off because the, the, of the premium we've received in the takeover offer. But you could look at any of the other companies on this list, um, which makes up about 80% of the value of the fund, and I could tell you a similar story. So high quality businesses with management teams we, we really rate, where we've taken meaningful equity stakes, where we've got, we think, good influence and, and good relationships with the management teams, and where we can point to very clear precedent transactions in private markets where the businesses have been bought and sold, which have similar characteristics, for very material premium to, 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 the, to where these companies are currently trading. And uh, I, I guess I won't go through every, every single one, but you know, XPS Pensions, which is our, our other uh, sort of next biggest uh, investment after Medicare now, um, it's, a, it's a pensions and actuarial consultancy business, a very topical area at the moment because of what's been going on in the, in the pensions market. You know, it's only every second day you'll see something about pensions and, and where they should be investing in, in the FT. Um, uh, XPS are, are right at the centre of that market. It's a fantastic market because um, trustees of pension schemes have to do actuarial valuations for their, for their, uh, for, for their members and their pensioners. So you know, there's a regulatory driver for, for the, the, the demand for their services. They have inflation-linked contracts. So every year they're able to put their prices up and, uh, and that's, that's contracted. So they're, they're, they're able, to, um, they're able to, to grow just as a result of, of kind of keeping the contracts they've got without having to win more, although they are doing that too. Um, it's, a, it's a strong profit margin business. It's growing its top line in, in, in double digits. It's growing its bottom line even faster. It generates lots of cash. Uh, those cash the, that cash goes to pay a uh, very attractive dividend yield. Lots of its people are, are also shareholders, and therefore they, they want the dividend as well as the, and the management want the dividend, not just external shareholders. Um, Yet yeah, this company, because of the stock market, because asset allocators are allocating away from the UK at the moment, you can buy this business on between a 30 and 50% discount to similar businesses that have been transacting in private markets. Private equity are very uh, active in this space. So I'm not saying... XPS is going to get taken out. I'm saying it's a very undervalued company, and we are working with them to try and address that discount. So I won't, I won't go through all the others, but some of them you'll, you'll know, and I'm sure there'll be questions at the end. Um, so just just to wrap up, um, you know, this is this is what you're buying if you buy this 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 this, this portfolio currently. As I said, 80% of the value in the top 10. Uh, the characteristics of the top 10: high single-digit revenue growth, uh, high single-digit profit growth. EBITDA margins that are well above 20% indication quality. Uh, you're buying a portfolio which has very low financial, oops, sorry, very low financial leverage. So you can see 0.3 times net debt to EBITDA. So these are these are not risky businesses. They're profitable, cash-generated businesses with low debt that are trading on a, an aggregate EV, EV EBITDA multiple of 8.2 times. I said to remember the takeover multiple, and you know, the average takeout multiple <coughs> from our portfolio has been 13 and a half times over the last sort of two and a half years since I've been involved in this trust. That's very similar to the average takeout multiple across the whole of the UK stock market over the last five years. Uh, it's, it's very similar to uh, the, the average uh, takeout multiple for lots of different businesses that we see that are very comparable to individual companies that we, that we own here, so XPS being, being an example there. Uh, so we think we've got a really high quality portfolio of companies, but trading at a big discount. We are working with those management teams and those boards to try and un unlock that. Medica is a great example of, of how we're able to do that in, in some of these situations. So I will uh, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over because I know you probably want questions and I've got, I've got looking at the time at the back. I probably need to do that. Um, look, there's a lot of negative commentary about the UK market. There's a lot of negative commentary about the UK economy. But for me, there are a whole host of really high-quality businesses that are listed in the UK 
that are cheap or discount, uh, discounted valuations just because they're listed in the UK, not because of anything to do with the actual underlying fundamentals of those companies. And so it's our job to, to try and, and find those and identify those and then help the companies uh, and the management of those companies to, to try and realise that value. And I hope most of them managed to do that by getting re-rated by the stock market because people like your good selves as, as sort of think there's interesting opportunities and you start to buy the shares and, and asset allocators start to, to notice that private equity are getting interested in, in public companies and, and, and put some money back into the UK. I think it will happen. It may not happen immediately, but, but I think the, the takeover activity surge that we're seeing is, is a real eye-opener about how discounted some of, these, some of these stocks are. So I'll pause there. Um, Ken, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Any questions for Ken, please? Gentleman here, please speak. Uh, hi, you get a one-time boost when you get the takeovers, which is great. Yep. Uh, but you've got to recycle that cash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, have you got a long list of, you know, replacements on the on the on the sidelines? Yeah. So the way the way we manage this this trust is, as I said, it's sort of 15 to 25 holdings. At the moment is 18. Most of the values in the top 10. Those that, those top 10 are the ones where we've done all the work, built the relationships, bought the stakes, kind of, and are now in the process of engaging to try and unlock the value. But the, the rest of the companies in the portfolio, which make up only 20% of the value, those are the, the sort of toehold stakes. Those are the, the uh, I guess, the active pipeline of opportunities which we are, you know, we're, we're building our knowledge, we're building our, our, our stake. Um, and so when, when I said earlier on, we're going to get the cash uh, coming in, in in about 10 days' time from the Medica takeover. You know, we have a very active pipeline, both companies inside, in the portfolio today, um, but also a, a, a watch list of, of businesses outside the portfolio, but where we've been doing a lot of work and, and building relationships um, where, where we can redeploy that capital. So at the moment, um, you know, takeovers, actually, that, that provides us the opportunity to recycle cash into, into what I think is a really attractive set of, of, of opportunities now because of the valuations. So, yeah. Question towards the back. Chris, did you have one? No, sorry, I misunderstood you. I think you said this question. So what's, what's the portfolio turnover, um, and how much of that is from M&A activity mm -hmm. And how much of that is you exiting a position for other reasons? Yeah, so it's, it's typically over the long term, it's been sort of 20 to 25 percent portfolio turnover. So it's an so average holding period of four to five years, and that's that's kind of how we think about an investment. So we're not we're not investing in anything because we think it's going to get taken over in the next six months. That's not our our, our approach. Our approach is a long term approach, buying high quality businesses at discounts to, to the long term potential value and then working with the management teams to try and unlock that value. And that might be through, through a whole host of different things. It's not just about takeovers. It just so happens that at the moment, um, the, the, the takeover activity is, is elevated, because, and that's because there's such a big sort of arbitrage for private equity between what they pay in private markets and what the, the, the UK market is currently valuing these companies at. And that won't last forever, um, but we don't need it. We don't need takeovers to, 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 for us to generate value. That you know, These companies should be able to grow their profits and the stock market also ebbs and flows in terms of how it rates, rates businesses. Um, and I don't have the stat off the top of my head about what proportion of our turnover comes from takeovers, but you can see from the, the, the slide I showed you that there's, there's been a number of, take, of, of takeovers over the last few years, but there's also been a number of companies where we've exited by selling in the market as well because they've got to our target price and they've been fully rated and, and you know, there's better opportunities elsewhere. Any other questions for Ken, please? There's a couple here, please, Pete. Could you tell us something about what your management costs and uh, fees are, and also are there performance fees, which, if you get these great exits, mm -hmm. <laughs> eat into it? Um, it's, a, it's a great question, very topical. Um, I'd say our fees are very good value, but that, I probably would say that, wouldn't I? Um, so the, the, the headline um, management fee, so the, the fund management fee that we have on the, on the trust is 1% per annum. So it's slightly higher than you know, some typical open-ended funds would be, but the, the, the level of resource applied to, to, the, to managing these positions is, 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 is higher as well. If you compare that to private, I should have put it onto the, the, the comparison between private equity, public equity. You know, private equity would typically be 2% plus 20% sort of performance fee. There is a performance fee on, on the trust, um, which is it's capped, though. So it's capped a, a maximum of 65 basis points. Um, 
uh, but it only pays when it's gone above the high watermark of when it paid the last performance fee. So it's, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it, we think it aligns shareholders with, with, with driving performance. And there's a question, there's another, sorry, just the gentleman there first. And we'll come to you next. Um, the private equity groups have suffered recently, uh, arguably, arguably because of uh, higher interest rates. Um, yeah. uh, how do you view, uh, how do you see your business in terms of higher interest rates? I mean, how, how, do you, how, how much has it affected it and, and, and mm -hmm. so on? Thank you. Yeah, so I think there's, there's a few, few considerations. Well, the, the first one is you know, how, what it's done to growth here for longer duration investments, and, and so the cost of capital has gone up, and, and that's that's made it less attractive. And hence, you've seen big sell-off in in kind of earlier stage technology companies. We don't invest in those sort of things in this in this fund. We invest in established, profitable cash generative businesses, and we're and we're very disciplined on valuation. So we're not paying very high multiples in the hope of sort of returns coming through in 10, 10, 20 years time or big disruptions. We're looking for businesses that are profitable today that have gen, gen, that, that, that where on a three to five year view we, we can generate the returns we're looking for from the earnings growth and the cash generation of those businesses and if we can buy them at discounted valuation we can get an, an uplift on on the multiple as well through there then then even better so we're not we're not, we weren't we're never reliant on that so we, we underperformed when the, those kind of things are are, are sort of shooting the lights out and everyone's racing to get to the next sort of next big thing in tech um, but you know, obviously that now that's that's kind of t turned a bit um, in terms of the, the how it affects the companies uh, the, we have very low financial leverage in in the in, in the portfolio companies and hence you know, the cost cost of debt is not really a major is issue for the earnings of these businesses um, and we think in the current environment where you know, it, it, there's an economic sort of squeeze actually having businesses that have, that have strong balance sheets is really quite important because it gives them not just resilience but also optionality when other businesses might sort of get into difficulties and they've got they can take share or they can make acquisitions at better prices um, so yeah and then the last thing is that the fund itself doesn't have any gearing so if you compare it to private equity you know, they're, they're, there's, there's a lot of gearing in the structures that private equity use and so the availability of debt and the, the cost of debt are, are important factors in, in their returns. Um, having said all that, you know, we're, we are confident and we're seeing it in the things like the Medicare takeover that private equity still has a lot of money that needs to be invested. And even if they you know, can leverage their companies less, if, you, if you're looking at a public company that's trading at half price versus the one you might have to buy, you might be looking to buy in a private market, you can have less leverage and still make the returns that you're looking for. So in terms of how that faces off into our market in the takeover situation, we, you know, this, this, we, we, we can see and we know because we can, we're seeing it happening that you know, there's still appetite from private equity to buy good companies. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, um, I, I see that your dividend is quite small. Obviously you're paying out a revenue and it's fully covered now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are a capital growth business, and a lot of investment mm -hmm. trusts do. Some of them pay, have a have a policy of paying some of the capital out, yeah. like maybe five percent a year, four percent a year, whatever, like mm -hmm. Montanaro and also yep. Apex. Would you ever consider that? Because um, investors are looking for a return. Yeah. Know? So, so that there is a, the, as you say, the the dividend yield is below one percent, and and it's effectively paying. It's, it's it's paying the dividends we receive in portfolio companies out as, as income. So that that's the that's the policy. That policy is reviewed by the. By the board, so there's an independent board of directors. That, so it, it's the, ultimately the board's decision what happens uh, with the dividend. So, but we, as manager, debate that with the board on a regular basis. Um, the, the, the trust does have a share buyback program, which is designed to try and uh, sort of protect a, 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 <coughs> around about five percent discount to, to NAV. Um, and and so. When we make take when we have takeover proceeds like Medica, well, there's a commitment to return some of the proceeds of that uh, to, to shareholders through a buyback program. So there, there's an opportunity for liquidity in terms of people. If you've generated capital gain and you want to you, and you want to sell the shares and recycle, then then you can do that through the buyback program. So, so you know it's an active point of discussion, but at the moment there's the, there's no sort of active plan to have a higher dividend yield. Interest rates are higher now, so I mean people want a return. So. Yeah. Well, we, we, we're, we're targeting a 15% compound capital return. If the share price yeah. gets there, yeah. Yeah. but if it doesn't... Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> part of that is 
generating the capital, capital profits, and part of that is managing the discount. And then we're doing both of those. And we've got time for one final one, if anyone has a question, otherwise I've got a quickie. Um, just a quick one on the, on the investable universe. Mm -hmm. um, you've got some pretty significant holdings in the top 10. Mm -hmm. Is there a limit to how much you would hold in a company? And kind of the size of companies, the, the, how small and how large yeah. is, is, is your range? So based on the size of the trust at the moment, which is about 175 million <coughs> of, of NAV, um, we're targeting companies that are between 100 and 300 million market cap. Um, so you know, big enough to, be, to have some, some liquidity and be established businesses, small enough for us to be able to build a meaningful equity stake sort of within the, the parameters of the size of the trust and the concentration that we have. So, so that, that's kind of the target universe. You know, there, there are, we're starting with sort of well over a thousand potential companies and we screen down on various criteria, but there are a lot of potential opportunities relative to the number that we hold within the portfolio. Um, and yeah, so I can't remember yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.